Welcome to Clyburn Masterpiece. I'm Buddy Bray, I'm your host for this series, and we come to you from the Kimball Art Museum in Fort Worth, Texas. Clyburn Masterpiece is a series in which we explore the greatest masterworks ever written for the piano. We hear performances by some of our Clyburn laureates, and we talk to other experts, both in and out of the field of music. It's one of the most virtuosic canvases ever conceived for the piano, and it was written by Maurice Ravel. Of course, I'm talking about his Gaspard de la Nuit, the spirits of the night. We're gonna talk about that suite with 2009 Van Cliburn International Piano Competition gold medalist Hao Chen Zhang. We'll also get the insights of virtuoso pianist and composer Mark andre Hamelin. Our conversation with Hao Chen and Marc Andre starts right now. Can you tell us to start with how Gaspard de la Nuit became a part of your life? Well, I really got to know the piece. Um, of course, it's um, uh, one of the most famous and iconic pieces of the solo piano repertoire. So I knew it when I was a kid, but I really started to look into it because of the Clyburn competition. As for why the Gaspard is one of the most popular pieces played in competition, I guess the reason is very obvious. Um, not only because of its, um, you know, sheer virtuosity and um, the fullness of its dynamic range from the softest to the loudest. Um, and all the complexities of the piece um, um, with all its nuances and quick changes of mood um, that is not only demanding for pianists musically, but also intellectually. You know, after I really started learning the piece and started to understand the piece, um, it fascinated me um, for an entirely different, separate reason, and that is the um, endless possibilities of interpretation. And it really um, opens up my mind. What do you think his aims were in writing? Our received knowledge is that he wrote it to be a, as virtuoso a piece as he could come up with. Do you think so? Well, that's what he said, but much, much more importantly, and this should be the focus of any pianist who undertakes this, uh, this uh, masterpiece. The most important thing to, uh, to consider first about Gaspar is the literary inspiration. Uh, he would not have undertaken, I think, such a project if he hadn't been smitten by the uh, original prose poems by Aloysius Bertrand, uh, which are full of really startling imagery, really quite macabre poems, uh, either uh, in, in an in-your-face uh, uh, way or very subtly as well. And uh, I think that Ravel found them, must have found them completely irresistible. Um, and that, more than anything else, is what has to come out, uh, to come off in the performance. Although they have this original literature background and they're called tone poems, literally poems transformer formed into tones. But I guess once in the realm of music, it's given an entirely different life, a life of its own. Can we talk about the beginning of the piece? Just yeah. the very beginning yeah. uh, of, of Antine. Is that hard to play? And if it is hard to play, why is it hard to play? Well, I think it's so notoriously famous that when you actually get to learn it, um, you've, you, for me at least, I, I don't find it to be as challenging as it seems to be.
It's a very peculiar and unique sonority, which I think mm -hmm. is what we wanted, and and it's uh, the one that clo more most closely approximated the the uh, the, uh, the watery the the aquatic, water droplets, the aquatic effect that he had in, mm -hmm. uh, in mind. And never mind about how difficult it was. It is actually a, quite a terrifying beginning. Uh, so, and sometimes it seems that however much you have gotten to know this, uh, an instrument, you know, when you're playing this in recital, you know, it's always going to feel different than it once the audience is there and once you start playing. And, mm -hmm. You know, triple piano and, uh, and uh, you never know whether it's going to repeat or whether it's going to sound too busy or, or whatever. And um, one way I think to uh, at least solve the problem partly again is with tempo because uh, apparently uh, Ondine wasn't really that uh, conceived to be that quick. Do you think of a water sprite when you're playing? Yeah, of course. There are, you know, uh, imageries all the time when you play this piece. Uh, that imageries you have uh, in your mind, and naturally you cannot avoid having some kind of watery images because the music so ingeniously captures um, the feeling of water um, or cascades. For instance, in the end of Undine, there is this single passage where after all the harmonics are gone, are fading away, right before the end, there is a solo piano melody um, reappearing, but without all the harmonies, just it by itself. And one can easily, um, by looking at the original poem, thinking that this is Undine herself, the water nymph, coming out of water um, with, its, with her true form and singing a beautiful song and inviting the observer uh, to the water. Um, and, um, but also in the, original poem, it says, the onlooker says no, it refuses her. And then she sort, sort of burst into a strange laughter and shed a couple of tears, and then she disappeared. But you don't, there's no way in the music following that beautiful single melody sung by Ondine that you can assign a passage uh, knowing that that's the observer refusing Ondine. Um, because after the solo passage, you go into you directly go into the water cascades and then sort of the undine disappearing or something like this. So again, of course, there are images all the time um, appearing in your mind or in the listener's mind. And, Do you uh, think she disappears at the end? Yeah. In the music. Yeah. In the music. Mm -hmm. uh, because, I mean, uh, I haven't played a piece in 10 years, but like... Uh, that's how the, the, the first movement ends. Can we talk about how long it took you, what, what your process was in learning the piece? How, how long did you give yourself to learn the piece? Right before the competition, I mean, I had about three or four years, oh, sorry, three, four months um, uh, preparing for the whole competition. And there, you know, there are five hours of different repertoires. Mm -hmm. So um, I forgot how long I spent on Gaspard, particularly. I just remember spending more time on the Scarble, because I think that is wow. the... Why is it why is it more difficult? What what is it about Scarbo that strikes fear into the hearts of so many uh, pianists? My, the first word that that I thought about uh, is complexity. 
I mean, it's more, much more complex than Andine and Le Gibet. It's the, one of the most technically challenging piece um, ever in the solo piano repertoire. I, I do find Ravel's wish, and especially in the case of Scarbeau, the, the third piece, to have written like a more difficult piece than Balakirev's Islamai. Um, I, what's the point? You know, I mean, you have to make you have to make the thing playable. You know, <laughs> and it is to a certain extent, but uh, you you have to re resort to a lot of tricks to really make it work. I have completely over the years refingered. Scarbo, so that uh, most of the repeated notes are done by al alternating hands. Of course, there's there's other devices that I've, I've used, you know, uh, but um, that is, that is the main one that that can make the thing work a lot better, especially if you're confronted with an instrument that really doesn't respond very well. It was a, it was it was something we went into training to do, you know, to to play yeah. those repeated notes with the left hand and, and play them with. The, the requisite speed and to get the right sound and not to have it too loud and not to have it too slow. Well, there's, I, I think that uh, right away, um, a, a lot of people who play this apply too much freedom to it. It, it one. It, it shouldn't be like a, a, like a machine gun or anything like that or, 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 or as fast. I mean, it, the, the, the important thing there is to get the, the, the fondue, the, the sort of melting effect. You know? And it has to have a sort of menacing and uh, yeah. destabilizing sort of atmosphere as well. So in the beginning, you have this. Of course, that is uh, sort of uh, creating the image of some kind of tremble, uh, tremble, uh, a person shivering because it's all about this onlooker looking at uh, the appearance of this demon called Scarbo. So when I when I first started, I did what, as a pianist instinct, uh, and I believe most pianists would start this way, is to finger them, uh, like. Uh, so you do like four, uh, either two one two one or four three two one. Well, as long as you're switching fingers, that gives that makes your muscle movement easier with these repeated, repeated notes and also makes it very active. But the reason I stopped doing this in the beginning with the tremolo, uh, doing the finger switch, is be because I feel that it's too active. I, I, what I do is I, I stop with the finger switching, but I only do it with one finger. So it's... And that way it makes it, of course, much more awkward and much harder. And it's much less act active. And actually makes you m more scared. Um, but that way for me is, I believe the personally the right way to enter this mode of terror. So later on, when the theme appears, that's Scarbo, the demon it's, itself. And th that's his repetition. So with that kind of swift flight, the demon is flying in and out of darkness. And that, that's when you can be active because that's, that's Scarbo. But in the beginning, that's, that's the observer, that's the, the human. Um, so I think you've got to have different technical approach to it because you're dealing with two entirely different uh, imagery or realities. Yeah. The instability of Scarbo, the instability of the human being having to deal with yeah. a demon. Um, so how does it feel to try to evoke that? It's, it's about evoking your imagination as much as possible. Um, and, um, you know, for instance, this, you know, of course, I would imagine um, the demon is just vaguely appearing on the ground or just beneath your foot. Uh, or in this case, since the original poem is talking about the observer initially lying on his bed, maybe it's underneath his bed. Um, so it's sort of like this kind of snake. Uh, kind of uh, creature 
um, and just crawling either underneath your bed or you know around your foot. Um, but then, and so you, you shiver. And he's doing this again, right? And then it's even darker. But then he... I, I would imagine this being um, the, this creature um, sort of crawling and rising upward and, and sort of all, all, the, all of a sudden getting to your mind and you just explode with terror. It all happens in just, uh, you know, a matter of four bars, five bars. But I think the way Ravel was able to create this image, at least for me personally, was so ingenious. But I was just taught, uh, giving you that as an example of the fact that you need to uh, use every bit of your uh, either instinct or imagination to find meaning in, in this work. And you might have a completely different conception when you come back to it um, a couple years later, um, because music is always sub abstract. If you came back to the piece today, after 11 years, um, what do you think would change for you? Looking back, um, just by looking at the score um, and rethinking about how I played it, I think one of the first differences, now I more and more realize the importance of uh, the inner movement, the ligabet. You cannot imagine with something like um, as still and motionless um, and maybe unimpressive by comparison to some, something like Ligabet, how important this serves uh, in the overall narrative. Both Ondine and Scarbo are impressive by themselves, but you cannot imagine them being put together, uh, connecting, uh, following one another. Um, and I think it's the introverted inner movement um, paired with the extroverted outer movements um, that really gives the music a gravitational center almost. Um, it gives depth following the Undine um, and opens up space for Scarbo. Um, so that way, you're not only dealing with three separate pieces, uh, but you're dealing with somewhat a uni unifying narrative um, that is the Gaspar de la Nui, which is about, uh, about the charm of terror and the charm of death. Um, and, um, and in the Quebec, you're face to face directly with death. In terms of poetry uh, with horrific subjects or macabre subjects, this certainly takes the cake. Um, what do you think was so attractive do you th to Ravel uh, about that image? Just like the other two uh, pieces, I mean, the, the imagery is so incredibly powerful. And um, there is, uh, like, like the, uh, the other pieces, there is a direct uh, um, uh, element that uh, is on the surface and that's the bell. Um, which is uh, poses some of the most formidable challenge, pianistic challenges, because you ha you suddenly have to be this this incredible colorist and have an awareness of almost uh, what almost every finger is doing, uh, and how uh, and the the amount of calibration you have to uh, to do you know in performance is is just staggering. You have the out. Uh, outlying contours, the melodic contours, and you can create different colors with it. As you know, the Ligabet is about um, an observer looking at the dead corpse and the setting sun sort of shines upon that corpse and creates different kind of reddish colors. So you can do with all the melodic 
uh, contours, all, all the different touches and colors. But simultaneously, you need to keep um, being aware and the, let the listeners being aware this continuous, constant, motionless, still B flat as the church bell. Bum, 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 bum. And uh, because the bell is really a, a, not only the charm, but the substance actually of the piece. It's not about the melodic contours. It's about the bell that creates the image or the feeling of death because nothing is moving. Was uh, the Clyburn your very first time to perform Gaspar de la Nuit? If, that, if I'm not mistaken, yes, it is my first time. What does it feel like to play something for the first time, let alone in a major international piano competition? Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, you're never going to be the most comfortable yourself when you've played it in the first, for the first time. Um, but sometimes um, it can happen that it is the most exciting experience. Um, so because really you don't know what's going to happen, you don't know even know how you are going to feel on stage. Music, I believe, is not just about the notes. It's about in a space when you have people. And music is the communication um, between he, the performer and the listener. From the final round of the 2009 Van Cliburn International Piano Competition, here is gold medalist Hao Chen Zhang in Gaspard de la Nuit by Maurice Ravel. Thank you. 
a virtuosic performance of a virtuosic piece. That was Gaspard de la Nuit live from the 2009 edition of the Van Cliburn International Piano Competition. Of course, you were listening to gold medalist Hao Chen Zhang. Our thanks to Hao Chen for playing for us and for talking to us, and also many thanks to Mark andre Hamelin for his valuable insight into today's program. I'm Buddy Bray, thanks so much for watching.